Galactic. Thank you so much for joining us to Genius Tea Time with Rebecca Niederlander. Um, so Rebecca, in her own words, is an artist, essayist, curator, activist, and accomplice. And her artwork has been shown internationally, including at the Vienna Biennale. Um, she is a recipient of numerous grants, including NEA and the Dorfee Foundation. Her TED Talk is entitled The Art of the Journey. Uh, she developed computer... Uh, community engagement prog uh, projects for the Los Angeles County Arts Commission and co-founded the Art and Family Social Engagement Broodwork, which was featured in the New York Times. She's also the board treasurer for Grow Gifted and presented at several conferences, one on giftedness and neurodiversity, one on uh, parenting your transgender and gifted child, and being the best ally to the transgender and gifted people in your life. She is also someone who I am proud to have as a friend who I met during jury duty. <laughs> Just one of those magical moments. And really? A, yeah. Like, we would just we uh, overheard her and a wheelchair user in the waiting room and jury duty saying, why aren't these people having any accessible parking? And then I said, I just happen to do art that deals with things like this, and we end up becoming fast friends. So it's really neat. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to introduce Grow Gifted to us, which is the organization that we're going to be helping out today? I will in my talk. Okay, then that is fabulous. Yes. Yes. Please. Christine, it's also, you know, Christine Shoemaker, who's here today, is yes. uh, when Laura, so I, it, we were, we were sitting in the uh, orientation room for jury duty, and I was pissed off because um, it was, you know, on the hills downtown, and there was no parking, and I had to park like two blocks away and walk over, and so when they were like, does anybody have any questions, I rose my hand, and I started being an accomplice and saying, there is no handicap parking, this is baloney, you can't expect people to pay in this way, given what you're doing, like, and, and Laura came over to me and she's like, I do this stuff, and, and then it turned out Christine was a friend, and thus began the beautiful things that have happened since, which are extensive. Set to dumb. Yes. Hey. Let's would do you it. Like, would you like to get started? I would. All right. Yay. So I'm going to try this share screen thing. Uh, let's do this one. Okay. Is everybody seeing it? I'm trying to find a way to move us over to the side. All right. Oh, darn it. Go like that. Let me. Is that good? Oh, God. It just. Okay. You're just going to see a little bit down at the bottom. I don't know what to do about this. Don't worry about it. Yeah, we'll do that. So, um, oh, there we go. Um, okay, so this talk is called Chronically Gifted, Chronically Ill, When the Venn Diagram of Existence Makes You Loopy. And I'm wearing my interlocking circle shirt for this one. Um, I love this image. You may think it's like one of those stock images. It's literally a fortune cookie I got at Panda Inn one time and I, was, I just was laughing about it forever. So I love that it comes up. Um, so why this talk and why now? So long COVID, um, has made the, the issues surrounding chronic illness, um, much more prevalent because as long COVID turns into all kinds of other stuff, we're just, you know, we're seeing a lot more people, we're getting a lot more eyes on chronic illness and a lot more awareness. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm horrified that it's happened as a result of a pandemic. Um, this is me the day I gave birth to my kid. Um, as you can see, I look like a jaguar. That's what we're going to call it. I am a spotted thing there. It turned out um, that I was allergic to being pregnant. And I spent the last month of my pregnancy with something called a pup rash, which is like puritic and ulceritic postules of pain and suffering or something like that. Um, and I didn't know why I got it 
at the time I've discovered later, it's because I was allergic to being pregnant. My body responded by creating this all over rash. Um, but to me, it's this um, incredible reminder of like what is happening all over the place. Um, and at the time, my doctors were like, yeah, you got a rash, you know, you know, you can't do anything about it because you're pregnant. Um, so just deal with it until we can get your kid delivered, which is something we'll come back to later. I am um, on the board of GROW uh, Gifted Research and Outreach and uh, funds from today's talk are supporting this organization. Uh, I am very proud to be a part of it and um, thrilled with the work that we're doing there. GROW is looking at uh, the physiological sides of giftedness. Um, and we are very aware and very clear on the relationship between what happens in people's brains and what happens in their bodies. And I encourage you to take a look at GROW. Um, our mission is to do research that is focused on the physiology of gifted individuals, including brain anatomy, genes, GI stuff, all of the kinds of things, and also education and outreach. Um, so grow-gifted.org, learn more. I'll talk more about it a little bit along the way. Um, but I, I believe we're the only nonprofit in the world looking at this, um, and it's getting a lot more attention because it needs to. One of the main things that's come out of um, GROW's uh, connections and relationships is a study that was done by Ruth Karpinski. Um, I, there's a URL over there, but if you just Google Ruth Karpinski high intelligence study, you can find the whole study. But this is a researcher out of the Claremont Colleges, and she did a study in which she um, uh, put out a survey to the International Mensa Society and got over 5,000 responses to the study, um, weeding out anything that could possibly be, you know, data that was, couldn't be um, substantiated. We ended up, she ended up with 3,700, over 3,700 responses. And she was asking, if we look at the national averages of diagnosed illnesses, both mental health and physiologic health, what do we see in the data we know from like the NIH and the CDC as to how the prevalence of things, and then in the gifted community? And what we found almost across the board was a doubling, twice the national rates of things. So the work I'm gonna be talking about in my personal story is absolutely corroborated by studies that have been done. But it is also very important to say that this is my story. And one of the things that GROW is really trying to work towards is having there be more data. We have insufficient data at this point. There's a lot to discover and a lot of research in a lot of ways. And my belief is that through talks like this and through connecting with one another, we can create more communities and we can um, use all of our different resources to help us grow the information resources, et cetera. So there's a couple of people in here that are part of the gifted world, but for those of us that are, or for those people who aren't, um, gifted is one of those words that if you're not inside this world um, through a particular way, uh, it's thought of as elitism. It's why New York State is going through all of the crazy chaos that they're going through. People see it as like, oh, it's just a bunch of, you know, certain kind of people that are trying to elevate their own kids, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for this talk and for everything else in the world, hopefully, that you ever consider anything around giftedness after this, I want you to think about it really as a synchronous development, right? So, um, the Columbus group, this is my favorite definition of, of giftedness. It's asynchronous development in which advanced cognitive abilities and heightened intensity combine to create inner experiences and awarenesses that are different. And this image is one of my favorite images because, you know, we talk about what's the elephant in the room. And, you know, the elephant here is, you know, trying to pretend it's a cow, but it's not. It's a little bit different, but it's trying to relate and it just can't, right? 
Um, again, with giftedness, if you're uh, if you're in some of that world, you hear a lot about the connections to physiologic stuff like, oh, there's a lot of ADHD, there's a lot of autism, interconnecting circles, blah, blah, blah. But we never talk about the physiologic stuff. So as we get into talking about the physiologic stuff, what I want you to learn and know about is a guy named Casimir Dabrowski. Um, he coined the term, I can't even say it, it's like, it's a Polish term that means super stimulability. And he was a researcher who did a lot of work with gifted youth uh, around like eight to 23. His original group was 80 kids. Every single one of them had um, like a like a super sensitivity, like, and, and he started to try to figure out what were they, and he divided them into these five different kinds of categories, sensual, which is not sexual, it's sensorial, heightened awareness is in the sentence, senses, intellectual, this is the most common, uh, sort of the cliche of gifted, uh, the, the intellectual type people, emotional, imaginational, and psychomotor. Uh, psychomotor can be anything from a really incredibly competent athlete to someone who just um, physically is very involved. And sometimes psychomotor is things like music. Liz, you know this. Um, how does that connect to me? So the brain, as we think about the brain, um, we hear about different parts of it, what they do, which parts of the brain do which things, how it's involved, et cetera. And um, I'd always sort of heard about that and hadn't done it. And then recently, as a result of the illnesses that I do have, I um, did some neuropsych testing because I was like, OK, I think I am developing some brain fog. I'm worried it's, um, you know, like early onset dementia or Alzheimer's or something else. So I did a complete neuropsych eval. And the good news, the great news was there's nothing showing any kind of declines. In fact, my parietal lobe, uh, which is the lobe that is the sensorial stuff, is activated at, is working at 99% of what is human, what is possible. So what that means is that for me, like my relationship to any kind of sensorial thing, whether it's any kind of somatic experience, um, temperature, touch, pain, um, lighting, sound, all of that, it's on all the time, okay? Why is that important in what we're talking about in chronic illness, that my parietal lobe is super active? So the parietal lobe is connected to the sensory system. The sensory system is connected to the nervous system. The nervous system is the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nerves. And those systems, they go from the brain, as you can see in here, and they they interact with every single organ and all the systems in the body. So if you've got a brain that is constantly and perpetually taking in stimulus in a particular kind of a way, it can't ever turn off. Why is that a thing? Because part of that sensory system is what we call the vagus nerve. And a lot of us have heard about vagus nerve or heard about um, polyvagal theory. You'll see, by the way, that I've pulled a lot of images from different accounts. And like this one is Trauma Geek. Trauma Geek is an incredible person on both Instagram and Facebook, worth looking at if you're interested in Vegas nerve stuff. And you'll see different copyrights um, to connect you to different accounts throughout this talk. So the vagus nerve starts the brain, goes down, goes into all the, um, all the systems in the body, right? And it controls how we, how we breathe, how we digest, what our immune responses are, what our metabolism is, all of this different kind of stuff, sleep, everything. Um, and if it's overactive and unable to regulate itself in a regular way, yeah, you do flight, fight, freeze, fawn, you do all that stuff, but you're also like, you're like, you know, you just, you're constantly going and moving. So once I began to see some of the connections between giftedness and some of the things that I thought were of interest, my questions became, 
like how connected are these things, right? So what are my, my illnesses? How are they connected? So I'm gonna tell you about a bunch of them and then sort of what my thoughts are around it. Um, this is me getting um, uh, my weekly IV. Um, I get two liters of fluid um, every week for dysautonomia. And Sally is in on this call and she is uh, co-founder of, of the LA-based Dysautonomia International Chapter, a great person to talk to. And their account is a great one to follow on Instagram if you think dysautonomia may be something that is up for you. Um, mass cell activation syndrome. So these are some of them. Let's go through them. So mass cell dysautonomia or POTS and hypermobility EDS are considered to be very interconnected. Look at some of these symptomatic things and think about what we were just looking at in terms of what the vagus nerve and the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system control. So what's mast cell? So a mast cell, the way I describe mast cells is, um, mast cells are supposed to be the first line of defense in your immune system. They're supposed to be like, if you had um, a dog that, you know, when the doorbell rang, it just went woof and let you know that there was somebody at the door. That's what your mast cells are supposed to do. But in people with mast cell activation syndrome, your mast cells act like a, you know, rabid, feral, uncontrollable, um, you know, whirling dervish that breaks through the glass and destroys not only the person at the door, but the glass and the house in between just to get to connector. And they degranulate and release um, histaminic responses all over the body. This is a really important one for me within this community to talk about extensively and for lots of people to understand because it's extremely prevalent. Um, you'll see more. So mast cell disease is involves immune system, life-threatening reactions. I have had anaphylaxis to like simple medications. TMSforacure.org is the best place to go to for research on this. Again, so if we look at what some of the common triggers are, those seem kind of sensorial, don't they? Right? Looks similar to an image we saw before, connected to the way the body looks at everything. Dysautonomia uh, is an umbrella term for all the autonomic nervous system disorders. Nervous system disorders connected to relationships with these are some of the symptoms. These are some of the uh, illnesses that come about. No one ever mentions these are some of the other symptoms. And then EDS. Um, EDS is kind of having um, a highlight right now. Uh, there's a bunch of celebrities like um, Sia and Jamela, Jamil, bunch of others that are saying that they've got EDS. Um, the most common form of EDS is the one I have. 80% of EDS people are hypermobile. Um, so if you were the kind of kid in high school or grade school that could easily do the splits or who could like manipulate their arms and their hands in different ways, you could be someone with EDS. Um, and EDS is the reason why I am getting complete rhinoplasty in two months because my nasal valve has actually completely collapsed. And if I try to breathe in deeply, my nose shuts. So they have to rebuild the inside of it. And this is happening because the collagen and the cartilage that are in my nasal area have just, they've forgotten what they're supposed to do. They don't know how to do any of it. Um, EDS is, uh, they, the mascot for EDS is the zebra, um, because when you hear hoofbeats behind you, you're expected to see a horse, not a zebra. And for a lot of people, pr primarily people who were assumed female at birth, um, EDS is in 
I think it's 85% people assume female at birth. MCAS is 80%. POTS is 95% assumed female at birth. Um, and, uh, but I love what they say about this, that a group of zebras is called a dazzle. And we are a community of zebras. We are stronger together and we dazzle together. And I think that the intersectionality of all these communities, like if we grow and become closer, we dazzle. One more, fibromyalgia. Um, I still hear doctors say that they don't think fibromyalgia is a real disease. Um, I have been diagnosed with inflammatory fibromyalgia by the chief of rheumatology at a major teaching hospital. I know it, it is a real thing. Uh, here's some of the symptoms. If you're thinking about stuff that uh, maybe you, but it's interesting because like some people get told, oh, they have fibromyalgia when they have EDS. Some people like me have both, right? So some like some of the stuff that's fibro related is not connected to the EDS because the fibromyalgia is more connected to pain receptors and the EDS is connected to the faulty collagen and cartilage. But some of the symptoms will look very similar. I mean, it's a Venn diagram of total loopiness, right? And then, so there's, um, so this person is an EDS blogger. Um, and uh, Jan Gro, look her up. She's got really great resources on EDS. And she made this diagram to sort of show the relationship between what she saw um, as the elephant in the room, which was how do we end up with all of these things interconnected? And how are they connected to some of the, the uh, neurodivergence that we also see, like ASD? Um, so one other disease that I ended up getting diagnosed with, and I think is really important to talk about at great length, is something called Durkheim's disease. And uh, Durkheim's disease is literally painful fat syndrome. And um, most people don't think of fat as just like this thing. It is actually a loose connective tissue. So if you have EDS, you're more likely EDS is in your loose connective is in other connective tissue. Your fat is also a connective tissue. So if you have an immune response within your fat, you're going to store it differently. It's going to look differently. Um, and this is where I sort of I throw in that I'm I've also started doing a lot of work with anti fat bias because I was told starting at 14 when I was in the pom-pom squad and I was a size six, that if I lost weight, the pain that I had would go away. And that was of course not true because it turned out, of course I had EDS. Um, I had surgeries when I was 17, to try to correct the pain, that didn't fix anything. Um, but a lot of people who actually have Durkheim's are misdiagnosed as obesity. Obesity is a word I'd like to see eliminated. Um, there's just fat. I don't like, I think that medicalizing um, fat is not really healthy because we don't understand it deeply. Um, but this is a disease that I really, I think a lot of people, a lot more people have, they're still calling it rare because there's um, not a diagnostic specific that can, it's a diagnosis of elimination if other things have been eliminated. Um, but it's worth looking up and Durkham's.org uh, is a patient led society for talking about Durkham's, the woman that runs it, I've spoken with, and she's brilliant. She's great to talk to about it. Um, Liz, you mentioned RCCX. Um, Grow Gifted has worked with Shagan, Sharon Megalothary to do some work around the RCCX theory, which is one of the ways we're thinking about how these things come together. Um, and uh, I put this slide up, you can't possibly like it, but it's there, screen grab it, um, go to rccxandillness.com, check it out if you're interested, if you are if you wanna nerd out on all the ways that some of these things can be connected. Um, so it's really important also that when you have multiple chronic illnesses, People like the, the way that Western medical 
world is done now is siloing, right? So if I go to my rheumatologist for one thing, my mast cell doctor might say something else. And my PT who's doing work on the EDS might say something else. So in the end, people might, you know, people, it's like each patient ends up looking different, right? In the way that they present. And so one day, like there are days when I'll just forget because one symptom is really prevalent. I go into a doctor and I'm like, yeah, this is what's going on. And they're like, well, that's not mine to worry about. Well, that's because I'm not thinking about the other thing. So we end up finding, all of us end up finding each other in different Facebook groups, chats, different kinds of groups. In the meantime, one of the major things we face is that we're trying to like have jobs and we're trying to do things in the world. Um, and, but we're also being your own medical advocate is, uh, it's a full-time job. I had four doctor's appointments last week and spent another four hours trying to find doctors that would do a particular thing inside my health plan. Because a lot of these diseases, like mast cell was not named until 2007. Um, Durkham's, there's maybe two doctors that really can address it. So it's not getting the kind of research or interest. Um, so there's a lot of, of, uh, of patient led advocacy and research being done. Um, and that's one of the places where I'm really hoping that the intersectionality with giftedness is going to help it, help us do better for everyone. Along the way, um, I have experienced tremendous medical gaslighting, um, you know, starting at 14, being told um, by a doctor who couldn't figure anything else out that they could just blame me for what my pain was, um, all kinds of stuff. And I have literally spent over 40 years continuing to ask questions. Um, my dogged determination and my nerdiness um, is really, I think, the only reason um, why I have any idea what's going on. I will also credit a couple of incredible doctors um, who were the first ones who told me that, oh, I think you might have mast cell. You should go talk to this doctor. And, you know, different doctors over the way have kind of helped. But mostly, um, I know a lot of people um, end up in what is medical trauma, right? And people who have been chronically ill, especially people who were assumed female at birth, um, get told they're hysterical. We know all of this stuff from way back when. Um, and so people end up with a lot of medical trauma. Um, also, in terms of getting my diagnoses, there's a lot of testing that was painful and embarrassing and humiliating at times. Um, and even uh, the solutions can be all those things. And um, we really need to be talking more about medical trauma. There was a recent study that actually came out and I was looking for it before this talk and I couldn't find it, which is interesting. Um, but there is a new study that brings up a new diagnosis called CAT, um, stands for clinic, I think it's clinic assisted trauma, clinician assisted trauma, which is the med which is medical trauma. I mean, it's being named now and discussed and we need to figure it out. If you see yourself in any of the illnesses I've talked about, um, or if you have other illnesses, um, I really highly recommend Megan O'Rourke's book, Invisible Kingdom, Reimagining Chronic Illness. Um, it's brilliant. Uh, my copy is highlighted more than any of my college textbooks ever were. Uh, Megan is a professor at Columbia and the former book editor, I think for the New York Review obviously gifted and asynchronous in her own ways. And she wrote a book about all of the different aspects and um, how we find out what, how we figure out what's going on with us, how we navigate it and how we come together and how it can work. So as you're doing all of your own research and investigating what's going on with you, I encourage you, I implore you, use the resources that GROW has created and is putting out there. 
there is still so much to learn and study about how uh, gifted folks are experiencing physiological stuff um, and how it connects to research on brains and how brains work and how it all comes together. Um, we have this open source uh, research arm, this library, which we maintain. There are people literally employed to make sure that there are good links. If you find research, send it to me, send it to Grow, so we can add it in and increase the resources that we have for each other. And that is the talk. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Um, do I'm going to look through the chat for a moment and take a it. deep breath. <laughs> See if there's good everyone, questions. Can everyone take a breath and hydrate? Yeah, everybody okay. take a breath. That was a lot really fast. It was. It's an awful lot. Um, I'll give slides, you know, sharing what I can. Thank you. The thing that, um, the thing that occurred to me throughout all of the slides repeatedly was the intersection of all of these things with, uh, with ACEs, with, with early, with adverse childhood events or adverse childhood experiences and the effects of trauma at a physiological level in, in, in the, in the nervous system and in specifically vagal function. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's why like I, Pamela and I have talked at great length about how can body work help with any of this stuff? Um, yeah. It, it, I'm looking through the comments. Oh, thanks, Heidi. Oh, the link doesn't open. Ugh. The second one does, though. Okay, good. <sighs> Thoughts, questions, ideas? Overwhelmed? Yeah. No, it feels yeah. like something that um, that if people are getting together as much as possible to share some of these experiences, that they'll actually will probably find a lot more things that are linked. I have an i I've had an idea that's been screaming in my head for uh, months, and it is Star Trek inspired. I'm a big geek, so bear with me. <laughs> um. In DS9, season three, episode 11 and 12, um, big geek, um, there is two episodes that um, concern the Bell Riot, which is a time traveling episode where uh, three of the characters get transported back in time to September 2024 in San Francisco. And the number of things they got so creepily right when they wrote that back in 1996. <laughs> and the lynch point, I mean, I highly recommend everybody watch those two episodes especially, but you know, all of Star Trek and DS9 especially. But um, the lynch point in it, aside from the whole martyrdom of the one guy that died, um, spoiler alert, um, but the, the, the real thing was that there was a platform that got between the people that were suffering and the people, everybody else, who was wall, literally walled off intellectually and physically from each other. And that is really not far off from how our community and many other marginalized communities are treated in the society. And so I have been dreaming of um, something that I have not been capable of putting together because I've just been dealing with my own survival. But I would love to create a platform to where people within you know, our community or other communities could take turns and tell their stories, talk about this stuff, and just have it be a continuous stream of like, you know, segments of people talking to where, you know, somebody can pre-review it, make sure it's, you know, safe for the, <laughs> safe-ish for the internet, considering 
the amount of horrible things that we have to discuss from what we've been through. Um, but the fact that it just isn't talked about, majority of my medical doctors have never even heard of dysautonomia. My, you know, the, the doctor evaluating me for whether or not I was disabled for my SSA claim had never heard of dysautonomia. My judge didn't even mention it on the paperwork. So, yeah, and looking at, I mean, I've been doing some real research on um, SSI and SSDI um, because there are, there's going to be a lot more claims because of long COVID. Um, long, there are, there are already longitudinal, there are already studies around the relationship between long COVID and, and POTS in particular. Um, and MCAS is showing up more and more in, in that. And um, I've already been told by my MCAS doctor that insurance companies are starting to deny claims for things like, like for the surgery I'm going to have, right, in April, I'm having my surgery, my nose surgery on 420. Everybody's got to love that. Good laugh. Um, but like, I have, it's, it's post, it's normally an, just an outpatient, right? You go in, it's a surgery, it's two hours, you go home that day. I have to stay overnight to make sure that whatever they, whatever anesthesia they put through me, I, I don't like, I mean, my skin's red right now because I don't know why, but like that I don't respond massively to it. That the fact that, you know, that the metals in the instruments that are ended up being used, that I don't have some kind of histaminic response to that. Um, I have to have like every four hours, a Benadryl um, IV run through me for the first 24 hours to make sure to suppress it, right? Any of that. And she was warning me, like, we're seeing more and more of those kinds of things denied by insurance companies, right? Um, one of the other things that's, that I, that's going on for me, small fiber neuropathy, we did the the biopsies, I have a particular kind of an autoimmune antibody that's very clearly there. It's three times what it's supposed to be. The known response for that is to do IV um, immunoglobulin and no insurance company will cover it for small fiber neuropathy because it's $10,000 a shot. And so I can, we've been searching through all of the teaching hospitals, who's got a clinical neurologist who's like doing the work and getting it right. And why is it 10 grand a shot? Because it's not popular enough to be used. Like, right. Like it's, so there's, there's a whole lot of, um, we're going to see a lot more with it. And so we're going to see a lot more SDI, Molly, mm -hmm. you know, I see you there. I love that you're down. Usually I am down as well. I had to sit up for this. Right. But like, um, but I'm still sitting like in a very comfy spot. Um, you know, we're going to see, we're having to really re rethink about what it means. Like, what does it mean to be, where is our self-worth, right? Our self-worth outside of being a laborer outside of like, what do like, what does it mean to be a contributing citizen? What do all of these things mean? Like, these are huge questions that I think that only these intersectionalities, people who, um, you know, how we're all thinking about all of this, that we're going to have to come, we're fighting a whole big battle. Joan. Question. Rebecca, you actually bring up so many excellent points, especially with long COVID. And one of the things that I can't help but think about is how challenging it is to go through all of the medical issues and of course the insurance issues and also figure out advocacy, not just for yourself, but for now what's going to become the masses. And what does that look like when you have politicians fighting against things like SSI and like Medicare um, in many, many states? How do we wind up getting more involved in that? Is there any sort of organization that gets involved with that? But that wasn't my question. <laughs> Laura's laughing because she knows. <laughs> um, my question is something very small that you brought up earlier, um, and that was body work and how body work helps. How does it help? Um, I mean, I'll give my experience, and then that may be something that Pamela has some 
I some speak. thoughts about, mm-hmm. some yeah. big thoughts about. Um, so, you know, when I talk about medical trauma, I'm talking about like the fact that unless, that I have now put into my chart that the teaching hospital that I get most of my care at, that there are to be no medical students, no medical fellows, nobody that is not my doctor in the room, in the, having to do with it. It is not like, I get that everybody needs to learn how to do stuff, but that's, it's better if, if they're learning with people that are not hyper medicalized, whose bodies are, are not hyper oversensitized to every single thing. The other problem with those kinds of people is that they don't know shit about these kinds of illnesses and diseases. Um, I had a medical fellow one time tell me that I couldn't possibly have a, be at a pain level of six because I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't bring a, I didn't use a walker to come into my orthopedic appointment. And I was just like, do you not know about EDS? Like I have to make a decision every day. Is it going to be my hips that hurt? Or is it going to be my wrists that hurt today? I chose hips. So I don't use something that requires me to push with, right. So good body work helps people to reintegrate their brain and their body's connections together. The best body work um, works towards resolving medical trauma, in my opinion. And then it also creates positive pathways between the brain and the body, which are become completely disconnected, uh, especially with brains that are, have high functioning parietal lobes like mine, um, who are, who are whirling and stimulating like this really good body work um, from people that are trusted creates all the kinds of good pathways. Pamela? Explains a little bit. What modalities are we speaking about when we're talking body work specifically? That's going to depend on each person. I know people that swear by acupuncture. I've had really good success with acupuncture in periodic, but it doesn't stay cranial sacral, uh, what Pamela does. Um, I mean, the other thing that's super important and that I, I think is really important to mention here, um, I would say that the likelihood of people having, of people who were assumed female at birth and who have any kind of chronic illness also having pelvic floor dysfunction, um, which results in um, you know, uh, uh, pain, pain with sex results in stress incontinence, re- results in fecal incontinence, results in painful hips, results in sacroiliac joint issues, results in uh, vestibulitis, results in like lichen sclerosis developing, like all of these different kinds of things. So really competent pain, uh, pelvic floor physical therapists who are good with with resources and help people like learn how to be in their bodies. Um, people with hypermobility EDS often have gastroparesis and other kinds of massive GI issues that pelvic floor physical therapy can super help with. So that's another body work modality that's really important. I have to say that it's much less about modality than it is about the quality of the practitioner. 100%. There are great acupuncturists because they're skilled and they know how to move chi and they know how to do the work. There are other people who are just following protocols who are doing acupuncture who don't actually do anything with their work. Um, yeah. And having experienced extensively all sorts of, you know, craniosacral practitioners who are really skillful and really attuned and really able to listen with their hands and craniosacral practitioners who don't and who just manipulate in a way that's actually not helpful. I don't think it's, it's, you're not going to, there is no silver bullet in terms of like, if it, if it goes with this word, it will do this thing. Oh. And that's what's so why frustrating. I, yeah. That's it's frustrating, but also that's, it that's why it's we're trial in, and error. It's well, it's not just trial and error. It's why we're in community. You know, we get first-hand yeah. recommendations. I really ask a lot. It's like my one of my primary uses of social media is yeah. really to come into my community, my extended community all over the place, and to say, who do we have who's really good, who you have worked with personally, who is in this place? Got it. I have actually hired Pamela at various moments when I just couldn't fucking deal anymore and said, here's what's going on. What do I need? What are your thoughts? And yeah. she's, you know, and and we need we need a thousand million more Pamela's. Yes. Um, but I, but like, we also we just keep talking to each other, right? Like, um, 
the, okay, I was wrong. Sally mentioned they're not part of the larger Dysautonomia International, but like our local Dysautonomia group, there's a recommended, there's a list of recommended um, doctors and who to go to. Like, you know, and, and, and like, what are different people? I mean, it's all, it's so much word of mouth. Um, which is similar to what we find in anything else. Like in the, in, within gifted world, we have lots of people, um, you know, like finding good uh, therapists, finding good people who can do deal with auditory and sensory processing, finding good people who like, yeah, it's never going to be the model, the thing it's going to be the, the competency and the informed nature of the people. That makes total sense. Thank you. And thank you for bringing this talk to all of us because it's super important. May I say one other thing about body work? Yes. Um, I just, I, I don't know everyone here. I'm a, a manual therapist and a somatics practitioner and I specialize in pelvic care and am very um, active as an educator. I teach something called Take Back the Speculum, which is a patient advocacy class in its in its foundations, which is teaching people basically how not to go in and get abused by their gynecologist, how to take control of an appointment and how to do their own insertions for people who don't wanna be touched and don't want people putting things inside their bodies. Um, and I do a lot of gender inclusive sex ed and lots of other things. Um, I'm also doing a lot of provider training and, and uh, things of that sort at the moment. Um, the thing about body work that is really, really helpful I find with almost every single person that I put, get to be with, um, is that if the thing that leads physical touch is actually a very informed and empowering uh, embodied agreement around consent, that the person receiving the touch is the person who the touch is for, and that they get to lead that, that creates a sense of safety and trust and power in the person receiving that has often been robbed of them, robbed from them in medical encounters, like repeatedly, in the kind of authority skew that happens in medical settings. Um, and that getting to be with somebody as a provider, as a practitioner that they're coming to see, who puts that entirely in their hands, that they get to choose what they want, when they want it, how they want it, what proximity they want me at, do they actually even want me making physical contact or not, and really being with all of the layers of that for long enough that the body has a chance to track interoceptively what really feels okay, um, goes a really, really long way to helping a person even feel like they can not dissociate constantly, that they can even stay present and um, over time, build a very different sense of um, just nervous system awareness, both of internal sensation and of external circumstance. So it's a really good teaching ground for that because it is intimate, but it's also, um, it is circumscribed by like a professional agreement and it's a place that you go rather than the place that you live all the time. There's there's a lot about it that makes it really rich that way. Um, and I'm hoping very much to be training a fuck ton more people in how to do that properly <laughs> so that it's not just body work is you go lie down on a table and somebody does some things to you and then you pay them and they leave because that's ridiculous. Like that's such a, that's such a, a not even two dimensional version of what it can be and should be regardless yeah. of my community. And you're doing a take back the speculum coming up soon, right? Yeah. It's on March 4th. Mm -hmm. If anyone wants to come. Hey, Rebecca, I don't know if you can see, but Liz has had her hand up along. Yes. Time. And I, I said, yes, I want Liz okay. to answer. Yes. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm, I'm finding I'm going through a time in my life right now that um, is similar to a time that I uh, experiences I had when I was 18, which was a long time ago. But um, so all the weird things, you know, I, I was just sitting here just jotting a list. And I, I mean, I stopped at 16, you know, I have this autonomia, you know, uh, interstitial cystitis, the dry eye, the Renaud's the, um, you know, uh, um, seizures, vestibular problems, um, and the, the medical abuse, the trauma, the abuse from trauma, I, I, I could write a book about. Um, but um, I'm, I'm gifted, I'm talented, and I'm an empathetic, empathetic person. And at age 18, I had to turn down three college scholarships that were just very, very important to me. And I didn't get to go to college. Um, and, um, that was very hard. Uh, I, I have, have, Wenda has encouraged me to embrace that I'm, I'm a smart person and, and going back over my transcripts and everything, I'm eligible for Mensa. It's like, pfft, I didn't know that. And, uh, 
Um, I may do that. I may actually join Mensa and have my own graduation party <laughs> instead of a college graduation party. I will have a, a Mensa party. I don't know, but I, I had to turn those things down. But uh, I, I ended up having a, a great career uh, as a professional musician and a, a television producer. And I was just noticing my I have two Emmys up here for um, soundtracks that I've written for uh, historical documentaries and um uh, I've had I've had wonderful times in my life um, doing great things, but then the health <clears throat> pulls you down, and my brain never stops. The creativity, the ideas, the 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 research, the understanding, the the curiosity, that never stops, uh, except if the depression gets so bad about the physical. And so I started a project about three years ago when the pandemic started i'd already been thinking about doing it but i teach online now because of the pandemic my music i have music students in ireland i have music students in oregon uh, you know all over the united states and uh, I, I kept getting requests for putting my program because i have a unique way of teaching um in a in a course an online course and and, and that sort of thing and so spent a lot of time and in investing a lot of research and, and some money and some some work into that and my health just crashed this summer, just really bad. And I ended up having an unexpected surgery in December. Um, and I just, I just can't get my health back. It's just, it's, it's just not, I'm not bouncing back right now. And I guess the bottom line of what I'm wanting to say is that sometimes, sometimes the creativity and the, the smarts, <laughs> the curiosity, sometimes it's kind of a curse because I have, I know people, I have friends who don't have that kind of approach to life. And if they were going through all of the things physically that I'm going through, they'd just go, okay, so whatever. I'll just, I'll just lay on the couch and watch TV. I don't really care. But it's like, I'm grieving right now because I don't think this, I'm not sure this project is going to happen. And I've put so much of myself into it. And I just wonder if anybody else experiences that too, that it's just, um, yeah, you, that you can't do your body, the, the old saying that the, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. And here I am at this age going through that yet again. And it's as bad as it was when I was 18, what it's doing to me emotionally uh, about not getting to go to college. I also had to not do college or not finish it or do the normal route. And my career was also in the arts and entertainment industry. And when I couldn't manage the, all of the other aspects, like I've still got the talent. I've still got the creativity. I've still got the brilliance. I've still got the drive. I've still got my dreams. But the capability of being able to keep track of all of the element, all of the hustle that keeps the career going, that keeps the project going. And it's been 13 years and I am still grieving. So much empathy, especially with a recent project that I understand when you've put so much time and effort into something and you, you know, you, it's your, it's not your job. It's your love. It's your life. Right. It's who you are. I mean, it's a, it's an internal place that I, who I am. And, uh, it's um I, I try to not couch it in terms of failure but that's how i feel i feel like i'm a failure um because i just can't gut it through another day you know i gut through every day when i teach sometimes at the end of the day after i've taught my music students online you know it's all i can do to just get some nourishment in me and i'm so sensitive to so many foods and medicines and oh my god getting through the surgery was like oh god most of the things that they did, they were very careful about. I have the MTHFR anomaly, you know, I have that problem. And so I don't detox and I was scared to death of the uh, anesthesia, but I came through it okay. It's the first time I'd ever had surgery. I had I had found ways to get out of surgery all my life. <laughs> and it was the first one I'd ever had. And Wenda talked me through a lot of that too. Um, she's been a dear friend, um, but it's, um, it's, you know, I don't want to take you more time, but, but it's, it's, it's really hard to find myself here I am again with um, a project that may 
get off the ground, but I don't see it getting off the ground unless the, the physical comes down to a dull roar. And so far it hasn't, uh, you know, in the last six months, it's ha it hasn't. I, it's a, it's a process. It's like a, a dead, a deadness. Something's died. I want to make sure. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm totally with you. Let's talk more later. I want to make sure Molly's got her hand up too. Sally, I know went through the same thing. I'm changing my career at 58. Um, cause I just can't do the sculpture anymore. Every time I pick up a power tool, um, I, I reactivate, um, an issue in my back and then I can't breathe. So I can't, I can't do anything, you know, like gut. I mean, like I gave up gas blowing, uh, glass blowing eons ago. I can't do like this, all of the kind of physicality. And I guess like what I want is for all of us, like we have, there's so many, what I, one of the things I wanted to kind of be clear about, and I'm like, there's so many things to talk about in all this. There's so many different ways of being gifted, right? And the overexcitabilities really talk about all the different ways. It's not just being, you know, uh, Einstein or whatever. It's not just the, the fundamental intellectual. There are so many other aspects. And I think that we, that creative people are creative problem solvers. And the more we talk, the more we are in connection, the more we are in community, like we'll, we figure, we'll figure it out, right? Like, um, you know, we'll find, like, we'll, we'll find, like, I'm, I'm, I've got a, I've now got a group that I'm developing of trans teen ASD, EDS, MCAS, POTS folk who, can't go to high school, are at home, are bored out of their minds, and I'm getting them involved in going through all the articles and doing research. And half the time they give this talk with me and they'll be giving it when I do it in two different conferences later this year because, because we, we have to find ways to like support each other and like make the things happen that we all see, right? Like how do we how do we bring all the circles together and, and support like who can do this today? Who can do that today? How do we like moving out of this individualized mindset into group mindset, group mentality, group connection, who brings what to the table, any table, any given moment, who are the allies and accomplices that will support us in the moments when we can't hold our shit together anymore. Right? Like that's, that's what we can do. And like, and that's where the, the, the chronic illness and the giftedness, because the giftedness community, like I got involved in giftedness and I hope we can just stay late because I really, both of these hands, I got involved in giftedness because in first grade, my kid who had had an amazing preschool experience was weeping and crying in the classrooms. And the administrators in this district were telling me that my kid was a behavioral problem, that I was a shitty parent, that I needed to be more strict. And I knew that none of this was true, right? And I went back to the preschool director and I'm like, what the fuck? You know, like, what's going on? And she went like, well, have you ever heard of underachieving gifted? That landed me. I was like, no, but that sounds just like me. Like, what's that, right? And that led me to an organization called Sang, which I super highly endorse everybody looking up at sanggifted.org, hugely important, changed my mind. And then I learned about all the emotion. Yes, thank you, Wenda. All the emotional sides of the gifted experience, all of the asynchronousness, all of the super stimulabilities. And then when I got all these other diagnoses, it was like, oh, now it actually makes sense, right? Like how all this stuff plays in together. Molly. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I mostly just wanted to, um, to say that I, that I understand about the grief and that I, I actually think that the medical trauma and the grief are the two pieces that people who aren't chronically ill really don't understand about this experience. Um, and that this, the constant grieving that happens as we can't do what we want to do, um, and as we may be people who even want to do more than the average person, um, but how that we're constantly losing that and it's constantly changing. And I was even diagnosed with adjustment disorder as a specific, you know, it was, 
my therapist, that was what she put on the form so that I could keep getting care. It was her way of understanding that chronic illness is a chronic adjustment disorder. Um, I didn't take that as an insult. I took it as like deep compassion for. You're right. You're right. And I'm, I'm thinking about it. There was another conversation we just had in another group where we're talking about somatic disorder that I have a lot of problem with because a lot of people in our community are getting diagnosed with um, with somatic disorders and it's not somatic disorders. It's actual pain. It's like, thank you very much. And right. like, look at us. If, if somebody just saw a screen grab of this, of this, would anybody say, oh yeah, these people are super ill and can't work? No, like no one would say that, right? It's this invisible, the invisible disability, the, this relationship to invisible disability, right? Like that, you know, and so like, there have been moments when like, I know I've parked in a handicapped spot and I'm actually like just walking and I see somebody stare me down and I'll actually just limp a little, like, fuck you. Like, I'll just do it. You know, like you need me to perform my disability for you. And rather than have a conversation with you about the choices I'm making, I'll just perform it. And then I don't have to have that conversation. Right. Yes. Go for it. Livia. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for using inclusive language uh, in terms of talking about gender. That's actually sort of the theme of the question that I had, which if this doesn't um, bring anything to mind or if this is something that you might think of later, that's totally fine. Um, you probably are aware, but maybe not everybody is that um, having an autism spectrum diagnosis often it interferes with receiving gender confirmation care because it's considered to be part of uh, autism spectrum disorder is like gender dysphoria. So I'm a gender non-conforming person and also an autist. And I, I view those two things as being equally uh, accessible in a good and healthy way. But I am really looking for um, any kind of resources or organizations for people who have neurodiversity that impacts our sort of overall sensitivity uh, and also experience a gender diverse life. And I wondered if you have any sort of communities or resources, books or anything else that might be helpful to m me and my community in that. Well, first off, Olivia, I'm going to say that yay, yay you. Um, I am the parent of a profoundly amazing and incredible, highly gifted trans teen. Um, who I fucking love to the ends of the earth and who changed my world and who I will march in all kinds of armies for. Um, one of the things that my, it's still anecdotal, but we're like developing the research is that, okay, so the higher you go up, the intellectual, like I, I, I hate the terms, but like you know, there's, there's gifted, there's highly gifted, there's profoundly gifted, there's exceptionally gifted, there's these things, right? The higher you, you sort of go into these ranges in whatever manner you get there, right? So like I'm PG because of my, my uh, parietal stuff, but I'm not PG because of my, sir, man, my limbic, whatever, right? So it's a thing, right? So there's different aspects. So the higher you go up that, the more likely you are to be queer. So like there's a school in Los Angeles called Bridges. Um, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine who's got a kid there, um, trans, uh, trans femme, uh, 26 kids graduated, four of them were trans, right? So when I say it's at least twice the national averages, like, you know, if we talk about Gen Z trans, we look at 10% rates, easily 20 to 30% rates within gifted communities, right? So like in my world, you know, being, being queer is like, oh yeah, you're probably gifted, right? Like, that's like literally the way I think about it, right? Okay, so, and, and preface this by saying that um, coincidental stuff is not causality, 100%, 100 million percent. There's also a significantly higher percentage of people um, who are on the spectrum in gifted, higher you go up, gifted, profoundly gifted, blah, 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 the more likely you are to be on the spectrum. In fact, lots of people I know who are like, this is their job to deal with, have very clearly said to me, if you're HGPG, you're going to have spectrum attributes, right? Which is one of the reasons why it's super hard to find qualified clinicians who can do testing for people who are HG and queer and potentially on the spectrum 
or ADHD or any other kind of neurodivergence, right? Because um, like what people, some people will just say, oh yeah, that's clearly a spectrum trait. Well, it's also an HG trait, right? Like these things are super interconnected. I do have resources, like I can't at this moment, Wenda might be thinking of some of them, um, but you and I know how to reach each other and I can check in with you about all of that. Um, it's really important to me that we talk about the positive sides of all of this. And like, um, you know, I, th I think that there's, there's so much great stuff in there. Um, and it's coming up to me. Like I, whenever I do my, the talks within gifted land around being the best ally and accomplice to the trans person in your life, I'm getting lots of spectrum stuff in there too. Right. Now, what you were saying about um, incidences of gatekeeping, right? So I actually was part of a group that did a word-by-word -word read of the WPATH, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, uh, World, yeah, WPATH, the SOC 8, Standards of Care 8, has just come out. And we did a word-by-word -word read. It took 52 hours. It was a group of trans elders and trans people who are trans and are also healthcare practitioners, et cetera, and parents um, and trans adults. Um, and yes, 100%, there are people trying to use Spectrum as a gatekeeping tool that people who are on the spectrum can't possibly know whether they're trans, which is, of course, as ridiculous as anything else is. In my mind, if we say there are more people who are gifted who are also on the spectrum, then we're also looking at people who are actually better able. The reason these things are interconnected such that they have better connection to who their authentic self is, right? So like my kid being HG already thought of themselves as a weirdo in the best possible way. We call it rain being a rainbow egg in a room full of ordinary eggs. So like when, when, when he was like, you know, I think I'm actually trans. You know, he was already like, I know what it is to be weird. And I, I'm, so I'm okay with just like owning my authenticity, right? And if you can just own your often, if you like, and if you're already supported by people who are like, yeah, own your authenticity, what do you need, right? If you're already in that headspace, then you're going to be able to speak it much more clearly. So like, we don't even know like what, what that relationship is. Um, in the truest form. We don't have, you know, 40 year studies or anything like, well, why is this the case? And so people are using it as a gatekeeping tool because people are assholes and people like aren't like willing to say like, well, uh, bodily autonomy means I can, I can be who I want. I can do what I want with my own body in whatever manner that comes up. Right. So yes, million ways. These things are hundred percent connected. They're connected in ways that I think are super positive. Um, the other thing I will say um, all around trans stuff, so there turns out to be this high prevalence of people who are trans mask and have hypermobility EDS and discovering that testosterone helps with their EDS joint hypermobility symptoms such that like I'm in a study at the Norris lab around, yeah, around um, looking at the genetics for hypermobility EDS. And I was asked like, you know, what was your, you know, what, what's your gender, you know? And then they said, well, what were you assigned at birth? And I'm like, well, why are you asking? Right, because I don't, I like anytime anybody brings it up in a medicalized setting, I'm like, where are you going with this one? And they said, well, we're asking because what we're seeing is that testosterone is really looking like a possible really useful tool uh, for hypermobility pain. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, well, I was this and yes. And I've got like one of the people who's like one of the dearest people that I have is someone who trans mask, 30 year old, Harvard grad, doing their post-grad work in clinical psych stuff, hypermobility, EDS. And we talk all the time about how the testosterone is helping their pain and like, so I'm also like trying to talk to lots of other people who were assigned female at birth and who, uh, who go with that as their, their gender identity as like, 
we need to look at like how you're using birth control. We need to look at how you're using progesterone. We need to look at how you're using all these things because they may be actually hurting your pain, your pain indicators. Right. And like, so I, I'm also trying to think about like, who can we say has hypermobility EDS and how testosterone might help so that in states where we're making it illegal to do it for gender, um, for gender affirming care, we can use it as an EDS tool. Millions of things. That is yeah. really enlightening in an exciting way. <laughs> What I would yeah. like to say for all of this, because I think we could go on for this for a very long time, and it would be amazing, <laughs> but eventually I'm going to have to go and pee. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, um, can we share these things? Um, if, if all of you are, I don't know if you're on Facebook, um, I have a Genius Tea Time Facebook group. Um, I'd love it if we can share some of these links and information um, because I think there's so much rich stuff that we can get out of this, but we're not going to, uh, we could go for another hour and still not get there. 100%. Okay, cool. Um, let me go and uh, grab that link so we can share that. And I see at least, a, at least one person has to head off at a new way. Hang on. But thank you so much for doing this. This is amazing. Yes, thanks for being here and for, yes, yes, let's share, let's connect. Let's, let's, let's let us do it. And if not, if not, I think y'all have my email address so we can we can find ways to hook up in that way because that would be really cool. Rebecca, will you share your contact information as a as like a primary super connector of good things? Oh yeah, I meant to. I did that on a different version of this. I'm putting my email in there. Um, I've literally like I don't even know what I'm going to do with it yet. I just started another Facebook pro. I mean, a Instagram profile called Rebecca Niederlander Is Sick. Um, I don't even know what's going to happen with it, but like, maybe we'll start to do stuff there, but I'm on Instagram and yeah, Facebook is easy, you know, generationally, I don't know who does what, um, but let's keep doing it and let's bring the research. Grow is going to continue um, to develop, like to develop the library and to try to develop community internationally, you know, let's, um, we can, we can, we can do great things, right? So we just have to believe we can. Let us keep building great things together. That is amazing. Yes. Does anyone else have like a final question? No, no. To be continued. <laughs> Thank you so much. You are awesome. All right, I am ending the recording. Dun, Thank, you. Dun, dun, dun. Thank you. Thank you.